why do we want to do a behavior assessment? Everybody's against a behavior assessment, or I should say everybody's against temperament testing. Everybody's against um, drawing a conclusion on a dog, which I'm against as well. So my statement has always been since the day I found a bound angel is that temperament tests are unfair to dogs based on a couple of factors. One, the dog is not in its natural environment, right? It's in a very stressful environment. It's not being handled by somebody it knows. And the person performing the temperament test oft, oftentimes is someone who's completely unskilled at reading canine body language. So they don't know really what they're looking for. They're, they watched a video on you know, either ASPCA's website or another website or YouTube channel that shows this is how we do it. In temperament testing, we can easily fail a dog. It's super easy to pass a dog, it's super easy to fail a dog. So if I put, take a dog out of a kennel who hasn't eaten, I put him in a room, I tie him, I back tie him, right, on a, on a stiff leash, or I have somebody hold that leash, I put a bowl of food in front of him that he normally doesn't get, which is wet food, right? And I start to do little things like in a prey type voice go, ooh, I want it, oh, can I have it? Can I take it? Can I take it? I'm setting the dog up for failure. I'm, I'm building what we call a prey drive in the dog. So anyone who's worked a protection dog knows that to get a dog to develop prey drive, I exhibit prey type behavior. I get suspicious, I talk in a high pitched voice, I tease him, I, I, I move rapidly. And that is every single aspect that is taught in temperament testing using a plastic hand. The second failure of the plastic hand test, the food test, is that dogs will often bite a plastic hand when they won't bite a real hand. And conversely, they may bite a real hand where they won't bite a plastic hand. So just because it looks like a hand to a dog, we've already established in yesterday's lectures that the sight is among the weakest sense that the dog has, right? The strongest sense is smell. Now a latex hand smells nothing like a human hand. So we have to establish that that is a completely, and that's why the food test to me is the one biggest caveat of that test because it's a huge failure. And it's an automatic death sentence for dogs when they fail that one, right? So if we were gonna do that properly, we would put food in the bowl with our hands and then take it out with our hands. That would be a proper food test, but nobody's gonna have the courage to do that, especially the people who are talking about temperament testing dogs. We do something with the behavior assessment um, that's a little fairer in the food aspect. Is I take a treat and I hand the dog the treat and I start taking it away from him. And I start to see how he reacts. I keep him on a leash. I don't tease him with it. I don't say anything to him or anything like that. So for those people who think that this food test is to see if a dog is going to be aggressive towards a child, they're not doing that. It's not in any way doing that, right? Because he's seeing a big person. If he sees me and he goes after me, he may not go after a child, but he's never going to compromise or are never going to conclude that I'm the same as a child because I'm acting like a child. The, the, these behavior tests assume dogs are morons, right? And the only people who are morons are the ones that assume dogs are morons because dogs are smarter than us in a lot of ways in that they sense things that we don't even see yet. They pick up our smell. If I put on clothes of, of another person, the dog's going to smell that other person and me. Right? I'm not fooling the dog. So um, behavior assessments are different in the sense that they're not, there's no pass or fail. So the bark evaluation that we do, it's a behavior observation, it's a behavior assessment. There is no pass or fail. There is no testing or anything like that. It's just simply an observation. So when animal rights people or people who are against temperament tests, such as myself, say temperament tests are unfair, why are you doing this? Because simply put, any person who's going to ask you any opinion on the dog is asking you to perform a behavior evaluation, right? If I call you and I say, oh, that, uh, that, that uh, three-year-old Ridgeback you have, the male, what's he like? And you say, I don't know, let me take him out and look at him. Oh, he loves to play ball, um, you know, he's really, he loves <laughs> treats, um, he knows how to sit. Um, he doesn't really like uh, other, he doesn't really like little dogs, but he's a really nice dog, you know? That's a complete behavior evaluation. Right? Except it's not formalized. So it's not structured in the sense that A, B, C, D, E, F all follow each other and they give us a fair breakdown on this dog compared to this dog compared to that dog. I said this in every single lecture I've done. There's a big controversy on dog to dog evaluations. Right? And, and Amy Sadler from, from Dog Playing for Life has made a really brilliant statement. She said that if a dog gets along in a playgroup, 
we should, we should strike the dog to dog from our behavior assessment, which is true. So if I have a dog and it plays in the playgroup, there's no sense now in, in putting a dog through the stress of another dog to dog. The reason I do it is only to show leash reactivity with that other dog and some dogs that may not be in the playgroups, right? So if a dog is great in a group, I think it's a super strong indication that that dog is going to be great in a home with another dog, right? But it's not 100% guarantee because not all dogs like every dog, just like any behavior evaluation, isn't, right. So in other words, the dog didn't try to bite me when I took his food away, but he might try to bite you. So behavior evaluations are completely skewed, but we're just trying to get a little tiny snapshot. It's like a match.com profile picture, right? They usually don't look like that when you meet them, but at least you have an idea of what they're supposed to look like. So that's kind of what I look at is this behavior assessment. It's your, it's your profile picture on match.com where people go, oh, I'd love to meet that person. And you show up and they're like, wow, how long ago was that picture taken? Right? But, <laughs> but at some point it was accurate, right? <laughs> Um, and that's kind of all we can really hope for in a behavior evaluation. So um, we, we want to give the dog a chance to pass. So that's why when I do behavior evaluations, I believe in using treats to build an interaction. Because what I'm looking for is how that dog is going to respond to somebody who's going to be its owner. right? So it's not like Joe goes into the back and finds the dog and pulls him out and starts yanking him around. Well, the dog is going to show absolutely no uh, pertinent behavior that's going to re result or respond to what you're going to do if you have the dog for three or four days, right? Or even three, four months or whatever. So by using some treats and showing the dog, hey, I'm on your side. Hey, I got you. Hey, da da. So now the dog is going to respond in the behavior assessment the way he would to somebody who he knows he should be responding to, not some idiot who yanked him out on a leash and is, you know, doing all these crazy tests with him. That's my reason for using uh, treats and stuff to build some kind of a relationship because is he going to bite a stranger? I don't know. That, that, that's, that's, a, that's a wild card. But is he going to bite me? Is he going to turn on me once he knows that I have his best interest at heart? That's going to worry me more. right? So a behavior assessment or behavior observation that we're doing under the BARC protocol is a snapshot of a moment in time while we're interacting with that dog. We would never say, the dog's great with dogs. Even if I've had the dog in 10 playgroups, I would never say the dog's great with dogs. I'd say the dog has been great with all the dogs we put him with, but he may not like a certain breed of dogs. You know, I had a Sharpay that hated black poodles. He would get along with any dog, Dobermans, little dogs, big dogs. He hated black poodles. Every time he saw one, he came unglued. No reason for it. He almost, he almost got killed by a big Doberman when he was really young in front of me. But had no problem with Dobermans. But black poodles, it's just, it spooked them. So you don't know that the dog is good with other dogs. What we can do is say, he's been in a playgroup, we've had him in a big dog playgroup, we've had him in a little dog playgroup, he's played with, um, you know, like really bully breeds, he's played with um, shepherds, he's played with every, whatever we can do. So notes are our friends. You know, what, the more notes we can put in. And also mention negative things. So if you saw the dog try to bite somebody, you saw the dog go after another dog, you want to disclose that. You know, too many people who work in shelters, especially in volunteer type positions, not you, Billy, will kind of always skew things because they want the dog to get a home. But there's certain dogs that shouldn't get homes. There's certain, certain dogs we shouldn't let out of the shelter. So just like there's certain people that shouldn't get out of jail, like child molesters and murderers and rapists, I mean, just put them down. Like, I'm all for that. And dogs that have attacked children, dogs that have killed another dog, they probably should just be put down. You know, that's just my opinion. Because there's a lot of good dogs we're putting down. If we don't want to put those dogs down, then we should stop putting down the good dogs first, right? Dogs that get along with kids, dogs that are good with people, good with other dogs. Those dogs are getting killed as well in our shelters. Let's not forget that. So when people complain, oh, he just, he was misunderstood. That's why he killed those three dogs and bit that baby. It's great, but he was misunderstood and he did it, so now he's got to pay the price. We've got to take that dog out of our society so that we can kind of get good dogs into society so this stuff starts, stops happening. And that's my opinion on it. Um, but that's not based on a behavior assessment. I'm, I wouldn't put a dog down based on a behavior assessment. Unless the dog completely flipped and tried to maul somebody, I would probably say, okay, maybe we should put that dog down. 
but a dog that's just, you know, he's, he's nippy or he's kind of like not really good with other dogs. We've had dogs here. Blossom wasn't really good with other dogs. I showed that with correction, she could be good, but she got out, she got a rescue. You know, we've, we've had a lot of dogs that were not the greatest candidates that have gotten out based on a behavior evaluation, but you need to look at the big picture. So in the dog to dog thing, I think if dogs play in a play group, it should be a big gold star on their profile because it's a great characteristic, it's a great thing to know about the dog. Um, I have kept the dog to dog introduction in the, play group, in the uh, behavior assessment only because I wanna check leash reactivity to other dogs, how a dog's gonna respond, because some dogs are brilliant. You get them in the yard on a leash and they're going crazy, they're trying to do everything, I unhook the leash and they're playing and they're happy. Conversely, there's dogs that are the other way. They're great on a leash and you take them off the leash and they, they, they get nutty. So understand why I have those protocols in here um, and understand that they're all in the dog's best interest. The only thing is to be fair to the dog.